Hajime, welcome to Samurai Sunday, a segment here on Comic Jutsu, wherein we talk all things samurai. I'm JT McRoberts, proprietor of the Comic Book Dojo, creator of things, teller of stories, drawer of tales. Today we're going to talk to you about the first in the classic exploitation series of films, Lone Wolf and Cub, Sword of Vengeance. This series was first brought to American consciousness by uh, its adaptation into Shogun Assassin by the late great exploitation filmmaker, producer, distributor, Roger Corman. May he rest in peace. Shogun Assassin um, is not a direct adaptation of Sword of Vengeance as it takes parts of the first film and the second film and combines them into one by bringing out the most exploitative elements, the juiciest, goriest, most tawdry elements of the films. It combines it into one, into one great peanut butter and chocolate samurai film of vengeance. And uh, that's how I first learned about it. But we're not exactly going to talk about that today. We're going back to the original because it was released in Japan as Lone Wolf and Cub, Sword of Vengeance. Um, if you are not familiar, this was eventually adapted. The manga was adapted into English by First Comics. Um, I don't know who did the translation, but here you can see uh, cover artwork by the great Frank Miller, Lone Wolf and Cub, uh, Kazuo Koiki, and uh, Goseki Kojima. Great great series. It's been a little while since I've read it, but the film itself actually adapts elements of maybe the first five or six issues. It kind of cherry picks from piece to piece. Like, for example, um, part issue six here in the American translation. I don't, I don't have any of the actual Japanese collections, but the, um, it, it's issue six uh, wherein they tell the uh, the origin of um, the death of Ogami's wife, which is revealed rather early in the actual film version itself. The interesting thing to note is that this uh, series was produced by uh, Zatoichi himself, uh, Katsu Shintaro, his his uh, Katsu production series. Uh, they produced several of these uh, Chambara type films. Uh, I'm a huge fan of it, and ironically, it seems that Shogun Assassin is much more well-known and heralded in the States than uh, the the long-running Zatoichi series, which had maybe 26, 27 installments, plus a TV series, plus a modern adaptation. The interesting thing to note is that the star of the, the series, uh, Tomisaru Wakayaba, uh, originally appeared in another samurai series a few years earlier, The Sleepy Eyes of Death, which hopefully we will cover one day here on Samurai Sunday. He appears in this as um, a Zen Buddhist monk and an empty-handed martial arts specialist, and it's interesting to note that he's uh, the, the main antagonist against Nimori Kiyoshiro in this, who's a sword expert, so they have this sword versus empty hand thing, but we'll have to talk about that at another time because today we are discussing Lone Wolf and Cub. I love the, the opening of this film because um, it, it shows uh, the silhouette of what appears to be a samurai and a young boy um, walking towards camera and initially you immediately think oh well this is Lone Wolf and Cub but actually it's the uh, what we're seeing is a young lord and his uh, like his chief second or aid um, who is uh, bringing him forward so that he can commit seppuku to regain the honor for his clan. So it's very interesting that that kind of parallels the eventual, you know, introduction of Ito Ogami and, and Daigoro. But it also it does a couple of other things that I think are interesting. Um, I'll just throw this out from the top of my head in that it introduces both the elements of honor that are, are you know, the central 
foundation of all these these samurai types of films and they all deal with it in a different way which is what makes all these permutations of the Chambara series really fascinating but it also el introduces the element of children can die in this like this this is the opening sequence of this film hopefully I don't get shadow banned for saying that but you know this this young child has to commit seppuku and it also introduces us to um Ito Ogami where we see him in his official role as uh, the shogunate's executioner here you can see my own cub um we'll, we'll take this moment to oh there's Mr. Sasha unfortunately he uh he was attacked by a dog over the weekend and lost an eye but uh he's recovering well this episode is not brought to you by T-Shirt Joe and Fast Custom Shirts, though they do the best work if you need your own custom shirts created for your band, your brand, your band, your YouTube channel, your film production company, what have you. Um, definitely give them uh, a look. Uh, they do the best work that there is. So anyway, so we see this child introduced. Uh, he has to commit seppuku. And then uh, Ido Gami as the executioner is his second. So all the child has to do is touch the fan to his his stomach and uh, Agami does the rest with the sword stroke. I'm trying to remember if it was actually in the manga stories itself or somewhere else where I read that a proper executioner doesn't actually like completely behead the individuals doing seppuku because it's considered dishonorable if their head hits the ground and rolls. So they, the, the, the way that they're supposed to do it is they actually they, they chop into the neck and leave like a piece of flesh so that the head will lop off. They are beheaded, but it doesn't go rolling. It actually, it's, it's, it's held on by uh, that bit of flesh. So <laughs> they, they don't, I know they don't talk about that in the actual film series, but I always thought that was interesting. And uh, at first it makes me, uh, when, when I see the opening titles to the Lone Wolf and Cub, it kind of makes me laugh because in the translation they show, um, they show the translation of Ogami's uh, sign that he has in the opening of the film and it says child and expertise for rent and it almost looks like well is this a translation of the title instead of lone wolf and cub this is like an alternate version uh, alternate translation of the, t the title child and expertise for rent so that's kind of funny um, but it's not that's what his sign says when he's he's traveling the land there's a strange fascination with breastfeeding in this this film is filled with breasts you know, on the Joe Bob Briggs um, drive-in scale, I don't know what, there's probably uh, eight pairs of breasts in this, which is pretty heavy. I mean, this Lone Wolf and Cub is firmly seated in its exploitation roots, and it does everything, the series, the, the film series, does everything that it can to really kind of revel in that. The, the manga itself, although violent in a lot of ways, is much more peaceful and artful and artistic and nuanced in some ways and although this this series does kind of at times skirt the line between art house and exploitation it's much heavier exploitation so uh they immediately jump into um the the sequence where agami's uh where they reveal the death of agami's wife which again is from later in the manga series like issue six here in the in the English translation and they show that his wife was killed by ninjas um, that they plant um, the Shogun's emblem inside of Ogami's shrine on his property because he he is if you're not familiar with the series you know he's he's the official Shogunate executioner so when people have to commit seppuku usually lords he will be the one to second them to make sure that it is done properly and, uh, he's the only one and it's a highly regarded position so these ninjas break in they kill his wife and they set him up to be framed by placing um, the shogun's emblem inside his shrine to make it look like he's praying to become the next shogun or something along those lines you know so the next sequence is the official bison comes to arrest ogami which is pretty interesting because ogami pretty much sniffs him out right away because all of his guards are heavily armed and they're wearing armor and whatnot and Agami tells him well you should have revealed yourself and revealed your weaponry when you walked in um, implying that he let them enter in good faith 
thinking that, yeah, this is a real official come to do these things. But it's really interesting because, again, we hear mention of seppuku um, when the um, when the officiate Bison says that three men committed seppuku at the gates of his of his home this morning, and because of that, he uh, he takes their message very seriously that they are accusing Itogami of of betraying um, the shogun and trying to seize power for himself. So that's the reason that that the officiate uses to come and investigate, quote-unquote investigate, although he all but admits um, that he's just come to kill Agami. Agami pretty much figures out that uh, Baizan is associated with the Shadow Yagyu clan um, headed by uh, Retsudo Yagyu, and he realizes that as rivals they are trying to take his position for the shogunate. And... Um, Agami has this little battle, escapes, and then he's su supposed to officially present himself and commit seppuku to regain his honor for being, you know, being a traitor and plotting against the Shogun. And this is adapted straight from the series. Ogami shows up and he's got the full white robes on that samurai are supposed to wear um, when they commit seppuku. And uh, the officials take that as a, a sign of reg resignation and accepting his uh, his his fate here, and Ogami just starts laughing. Like, oh, 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 you know, I'm not wearing this to 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 commit seppuku, but to show you that I walk the white road between heaven and hell. Now, if I recall correctly, they do call it the white road between heaven and hell in the actual comic book. In the film itself, and you can also see it on the thumbnail to this video, they call it the road uh, between fire and water. And you can see the elements of fire and water and then the white road that they walk it. You know, he says we are to become demons and accept this life. Uh, so that's pretty fascinating. So you have another good, really cool battle there. So then the film picks up two years later where we see Ogami in his full identity as Lone Wolf and Cub where he's a traveling assassin. He has the sign, you know, expertise and child for rent. Uh, it's really funny. I skipped over, I talked about the breastfeeding, but then I didn't tell you what it meant. Because the first thing that happens is he runs into basically a crazy lady who sees his, his son, Daigoro, and she runs up and she calls him, Daigoro by her child's name and she picks him up and starts trying to breast, breastfeed him right away. And Ogami just kind of gives him the nod, like, mm, and Daigoro uh, feeds from her. Uh, so that's the first thing that you see. But then uh, we get this kind of two years later sequence and you see uh, what are probably Yakuza or what have you, like looking at Ogami and, and they're like plotting. And they're like, is that is that uh, Ogami, the, you know, the, the former Shogun's assassin? So you can see that his legend has already kind of built. And off of that, uh, they show, they reveal a daimyo that is... Um, that decides to plot to kill Ogami. So he says, well, you know, I'll pretend to hire him and, you know, he'll have his own seconds, his own men um, assassinate Ogami during this. So he brings Ogami in to offer him the contract. And it's really neat because they, they just show the kind of the supernatural prowess that Ogami has with his sword work. So he's seated talking to this guy and the door behind him opens and there are the two attackers and Ogami just eliminates them like Jedi style, like psh, psh, psh. Yeah, he doesn't even get up, doesn't turn toward them, you know, just almost like a pure Aido technique and hacks at both of them, just takes them both right out. The film jumps backwards and forwards uh, in time, you know, revealing the, the pieces of what led Agami up to this. So it, it goes back to where he pretends to commit, that he's going to commit seppuku and instead confronts the Yagyu clan um, when he reveals his robes and he starts to walk out and the Yagyu say, well, you know, we've we've taken over the role of the Shogun's executioner. Now, you know, Clan Yagyu has has supplanted you and you will now commit seppuku. Uh, and if not, we're just going to kill you anyway. So Agami pulls his robes off and he reveals beneath that his official robes have the, the Shogun's emblems on them. And Agami, this is another thing dealing with, with honor and their code and whatnot. Uh, Ogami reminds them, you know, well, I have the, the Shogun's emblems, and, and it's a crime to even 
hold a sword and look at them, you know. So if your men are going to attack me, they're going to attack against the shogunate itself, which is a really interesting, um, really interesting bit of storytelling there and philosophy. So uh, uh, Retsudo agrees. He says, well, if we'll have a duel. If you win the duel, you can leave, but you have to leave your robes. So, um, so Ogami uh, duels with uh, the Yagyu champion. It's pretty interesting because Ogami faces off with the Yagyu champion, and they're in they're in a field, and you can tell that the champion thinks that he has the the edge because he's using nature to his advantage. He actually has the sun behind him, so he's almost like completely silhouetted from Ogami's point of view, and Ogami is looking at him, and. Uh, and it's a nice bit of storytelling where they have Retsudo is kind of doing commentary and he's explaining the two philosophies, like just in case the audience, uh, you know, doesn't quite under, just understand it. So he says, you know, my, my champion will win. He has the, su the sun at his back and uh, Ogami will surely lose because he has his child on his back. You know, so when they rush together to clash at the last second, uh, Ogami bends forward and Daigoro has like some sort of like reflective mirror almost on the top of his head and it reflects the sunlight back into uh, the Yagyu uh, duelist's eyes temporarily blinding him and Agami slices him down. Uh, it's really nice philosophy there and uh, adapted straight from the manga. So really the best bits of this film series are always coming straight from the manga and it's a shame that that it wasn't a more faithful series but in terms of just being pure exploitation it's a ton of fun because then you get this just this glorious spray of gore and blood when Ogami beheads this guy and it's just like fountains of blood just gushing out and it turns into kind of slow motion there for a moment and you see this wide shot of Ogami standing out in the field and then, and then the beheaded guy's blood spraying everywhere and the sun's still behind them so it's really kind of a beautiful shot but um, it has this you know this gory element to it um, almost akin to like the, the Grand Guignol sort of thing where you have this terrible beauty, this beauty in horror and whatnot. The funny thing in the film, I have to go back and look at the manga and see if the translation is similar, but the uh, several times over they pass, Ogami and his son pass by children that are singing these kind of weird little songs and the song itself I think is kind of it's almost like a Zankoan like you kind of have to think about it in some ways uh, so I wrote the, the lyrics down in, in the translation it's from high in the mountain if you shit a rocky turd it will be covered with sand it'll tumble down like a pebble here comes a one there goes one and they just sing that over and over again and you have to kind of think about it and I'm not going to give you my interpretation of it because that's not how that's not how koans work but they use the the storytelling device and the framing of the flashback and flash flash forward almost like in noir storytelling which is really nice here this this book ending framing sequencing to flash back to when uh, ogami makes daigoro choose you know are you going to choose the life of a child where he sets a ball out for him or are you going to choose the, the assassin's road and the life of a demon with me where he, he puts his sword out and this is actually how issue one of the manga opens now i would like to see the japanese versions just so, so i know i mean are these exact one for one adaptations from the japanese to the american or you know are they shifted around some but i think they are one for one uh, transferred over in the first collections which is really nice and that is the opening scene where Daigoro has to choose and at first it looks like he's going to get the ball but then he crawls over to the sword and that is his answer and Nagami tells him you know you would have been better off to die here than to walk this road with me then we get into some pretty heavy stuff when we get back to present day with Ogami. There's an R scene in it. I don't want to say it because I know this video will get will get um, <laughs> blacklisted and I'll be shadow banned. No one will see it. So if there are only like five viewers at the end of this, I know that that would be what did it. But so there's a pretty nasty R in it. You know, you know what I mean. I'm trying to skirt my way around it just to set up like the nastiness of this place that Ogami is going to. So it's basically at this point almost like a road movie. You know, Ogami is just traveling along, along the road. He gets to a, a, a village, isolated village bathhouse, and it's been overrun by, um, by just 
thieves and cutthroats and whatnot. I mean, they're mercilessly killing people and throwing them off the bridge to the road, to the bathhouse. And, you know, they, they're doing this sequence where they're attacking the women. And, you know, they threaten Agami over and over. And this is where you see more elements of Agami's honor and his code. And it's interesting to me because, um, you know, you, you start to piece together... Uh, trying to piece together exactly how his honor works because in my mind the thieves and cutthroats had threatened him enough I mean with you know a, a, like they were going to directly attack him or his son even though they didn't quite take that step I mean they're like swinging weapons at him one guy just hits him over and over uh, with his sword in the scabbard you know they're throwing knives around him almost like a, the circus knife thrower you know and Agami just doesn't react to any of it where in my mind I kept thinking like you know just go ahead and kill them all you know but he doesn't and it's um, not until much later that he actually springs into action but there's a sequence and I'm not sure if this is from the manga I don't think it is I think this whole village bathhouse village thing is just kind of made up for the film but um, so the thieves th there's a one of the travelers in the bathhouse is actually a, a prostitute named Osan and um, she is the first one to speak up for Agami and she says just leave him alone you know he's too he's too weak for you to even mess with you know see how he's scared you should just leave him alone and the thieves tell her okay we'll leave him alone but we want you to we want you to make love right here in front of us and we want to watch or we're going to kill you so again I'm thinking you know okay well Ogami is going to kill him or whatever so they uh she refuses to do it and she actually she explains later that she was going to bite her try to bite her own tongue in that moment to try to kill herself but then Ogami he just stands up and he drops his robe and he's like mm, you know, to, to go along with it and he makes love to her do, he, they do what uh the bandits and thieves tell them to do and they turn around and walk off and leave them alone and after that you know in true exploitation fashion you know osin is completely smitten by ogami she's like oh ogami uh, but there there's a nice sequence there where she follows him and daigoro into the bathhouse and they go into the bath and they're talking and i think she is the first one to explain the name lone wolf and cub she says you know i heard about these um soldiers being killed and they were highly trained and it was one man who had a child with them and they called them lone wolf and cub and that's how that element is introduced so it's a really nice bit of storytelling all throughout this film adaptation even for all of its exploitative elements in that you have you know almost elements of noir or at least you know a framework of what one would see in a film noir where they're bouncing backwards and forwards between the past and the present and catching the two together and showing various parallels. So Ogami is in this this village with the bathhouse and the um, the thieves and the murderers, you know, they're all part of this gang. They they are actually met by um, a daimyo who's traveled to hire them to assassinate another lord. And this is another interesting revelation of honor and, and living by a code because the the thieves, specifically the guy that's like throwing, that has like the throwing knives and he's already threatened um, Ogami several times over. He says, you know, we may be lowly rats, but you guys are turncoats. So even though these guys are murderers and <laughs> our wordists and thieves just lowly despicable gang members they still have a sense of honor and a code that they live by so it's really interesting and he tells them he said you guys you guys are turncoats finally the gang members decide okay well it's time for us to leave this village leave the bathhouse and they call out everybody in the village and they say okay we're going to leave and when we leave we don't want you to say anything and they all draw their swords and they say if we hear of you saying anything to anyone about us, we're going to come back and kill everyone in this village. And then they call out the group of travelers that were staying at the bathhouse, which includes Osan and, and some of the others. Like there's a sick samurai there who seems like he has tuberculosis or something. They show him coughing all the time or the consumption as they called it in those days. Anyway, they call those guys out and they say, okay, all of you can leave except for you pointing to the travelers. You know, this group is going to die. And even Osan, when, when the gang members tell him, you know, you can leave, she spits at him 
you know, it's like because she doesn't believe them. She knows what's going to happen. It's it's really fascinating, you know, showing her understanding of the samurai world and um, the codes at play here. You know, so the gang members tell them, "You are all going to die." It'll serve as as an example to the rest of these villagers. And then <laughs> during that sequence, they uh, they they pick on the six samurai and they say, "Come on, samurai! You know, we'll let you duel. You can die honorably." And the samurai is so weak, he can't even stand. So he says, I'm going to commit seppuku. And he tells the gang leader, he says, you be my second and just, just cut my head off and I can die with honor at least. And, it's, and the word second just starts reverberating inside of, uh, inside of the gang leader's head. And he's thinking, second, 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 chief second, shogun's official second, Ido Ogami, you know. And he suddenly realizes where he had seen Ogami before. He realizes that he's the shogunate's official executioner. And uh, he starts looking around. He's like, where is this guy? Where is he? Where is he? Realizing, you know, who they have in their their midst. And just as he's doing that, that's when Agami comes out. He's pushing the baby cart. And uh, right away, he says, listen, you can leave. And he tells all of his gang members, you know, don't, don't touch this guy. Don't leave Agami alone. Don't do anything to him. And his, you know, his, his, his little wormy rat-faced assistant is like what i'm not scared of him he's weak he's nothing and he pulls out his knives and he goes to attack agami now they've been holding agami's uh dotanuki sword this entire time so he doesn't op he doesn't have an obvious weapon but this is where the the great exploitation element of revealing the weapons within the baby cart which comes from the comic book which comes from the manga i mean this happens all the time in the manga where uh, that baby card is, is shown to be tricked out like a James Bond car. It's really neat. Um, where he pulls off the handles and snaps them together, and then all of a sudden he's got a long um, he's got a long pole arm with the blade on it. Big battle ensues. Agami starts slicing through them. This is a really good bit of exploitation film work uh, because because now he's got uh, this long Nadinata uh, you know pole arm blade. And he's he's hacking everybody to bits. Yeah, he cuts one guy off at the ankles and falls over and his feet are just sitting there, <laughs> still standing there with blood spurting out. I mean, he beheads guys, heads go rolling. You know, he just he's hacking people to bits in, in every different direction. So if you came to this series wanting just great, gruesome swordplay, this is where you're going to get it. I mean, it's much bloodier than pretty much anything other than the Zadoichi series that, that came before it. Honestly, I mean, it's pre it is crafted in the Zadoichi vein, which has all of the, the geysers of blood and, and whatnot. Because if you go back and look at the um, the Akira Kurosawa films, you know, he doesn't have you know geysers of blood like that. You know, a lot of his fights are really very very bloodless. Um, even though the choreography would be uh, entertaining at times, it's usually very very quick and over with. Um, you know, almost as soon as it starts. But here, you know, the battles are prolonged. There are multiple assailants, so it's just Agami just chopping his way through these guys, mowing them down. So here you get everything you signed up for. Um, again, Shogun Assassin, the the American adaptation by Corman's company, it merged together the first and second films. So it just took like the bulk of the uh, brutal and exploitative elements. Although. The direct version of Sword of Vengeance is truly um, exploitative on its own. I mean, I'm surprised that they didn't uh, direct, uh, directly adapt it. So Agami leaves the village. You know, Osen, the prostitute, comes running out behind him. And she's like, wait for me, Ogami, wait. And uh, he has to cross the rope bridge leading the village. And he pulls his sword out. And he just show, he doesn't say anything. He just shows her. He's like... If you keep coming, I'm going to hack this the rope on the bridge, and we're both going to fall and die. So she stops chasing him. He puts his sword away, walks off into the sunset. Credits roll, and there you go. And that is Sword of Vengeance. Highly, highly recommended for uh, samurai chambara aficionados, though if you're into those sort of things, you've already seen it. And if you're not, and you're looking to get into it, there's no better place to start than... Uh, right here at Sword of Vengeance. The the comic series itself, which I'm not, you know, doing an, an exact review of, but just merely mentioning some of the parallels, but the series itself, I mean, it's, it is like the gold standard, at least in terms of American samurai comics. You know, this is the way to go. Well, American adaptations of samurai comics, this is the way to go. I mean, it, it's absolutely brilliant stuff. I first heard about it 
when I saw the uh, documentary Masters of, of Comic Book Art. Frank Miller is interviewed in here shortly after um, the release of Dark Knight Returns. And uh, he, he mentions, you know, several artists that had influenced him. Actually, when he's specifically talking about working on Ronin, and, and he mentions uh, Kazuo Koiki, Goseki Kojima, in, a, in addition to uh, Moebius. So at the time when I saw this documentary, I thought, well, okay, well, these are who who's in, influencing him and giving him inspiration. So let me go and check these out. And I started tracking down the... Uh, the Lone Wolf and Cub series, in addition to, you know, watching the various films. Although I had already been watching at least the Kurosawa films over the years because of their influence on uh, George Lucas and uh, Sergio Leone and those kind of guys. So, there you go. Hope you enjoyed that. This is the first ever Samurai Sunday. If this segment goes well, we'll do some more because there are a lot of great Samurai flicks out there that we can discuss. So, what are some of your favorite sequences from Sword of Vengeance? And do you have a favorite uh, Samurai Sword series? This is one of mine, but uh, also, so is Sleepy Eyes of Death. I hope we get to talk about that one day in addition to Zatoichi. So, JT McRoberts, thanks for watching. Buy my graphic novel, please. Like, comment, subscribe. Tell your friends about the channel. And we'll see you next time. Mate!